All right. First thing we're going to start off with is Illinois has changed a lot. And these changes have affected animals differently. Um, so this is not news to anybody. The rise of large scale ag, changing landscape. Look at these two maps. The one on the left, we've got a lot of forest. We've got a lot of prairie. We've got a lot of awesome habitat right there. I'm sure that was a great place for a, a great many a critter. Fast forward to today and our map is maybe a little bit less uh, diverse when it comes to habitat. Uh, but certainly we've got a ton of some habitats. Uh, agriculture, we've got it in spades. So the, the different critters that agriculture has really especially helped out, uh, those being things like raccoons, opossums, even coyotes because of the boom of mice. Uh, those animals are doing really, really well. <clears throat> and since those critters all have a trapping season, uh, that's good news for trappers. Another thing you notice on this map is a whole lot of urban areas. And it just so happens that a lot of these fur bears, they make themselves perfectly at home, pretty close or right within urban areas too. So uh, animals that pretty much everybody has access to in one way or another, and we've got a lot of them out there. Now, one thing we mention in all of our webinars, all of our workshops, is how trappers and hunters sustain wildlife conservation. And this is beyond just the purchase of stamps and permits and all that stuff, which does go into wildlife management, but also through excise taxes like the Pittman-Robertson Act, which started in 1937. This is an excise tax that sportsmen and women pay when they buy firearms. This is built in in the manufacturer's level. So this isn't an extra tax when you go to Bass Pro to ring up your purchase. It's, it's already kind of built into there. But all of this money is earmarked to go right back into conservation. And uh, it's really a win-win because it's kind of a, a self-pay system for hunters supporting wildlife conservation. And it's put in a, a fund that can't be kind of borrowed from for roads or schools or any of those things. Not that it's those things aren't important, they certainly are, but we definitely don't wanna forget about natural resources too. And thanks to some very forward thinkers back in the early 1900s, uh, hunting kind of pays for itself really good. And one thing I always like to point out is regulated hunting and trapping. So since the advent of regulations, these activities have never led to a species becoming endangered or extinct. Uh, now, a lot of people who have hunted, trapped their whole lives, this isn't news to them. But people who maybe haven't, uh, th this can be news because you got to separate what happened before conservation and what happened after because it's, it's very different processes. Oh, now let's get right into him. Look at that cute little guy there. Um, what is a fur bear? First off, when we're talking about trapping, we're talking about the suite of animals known as fur bears. And fur bear is a small to mid-sized mammal that has historically been harvested primarily for its fur. Because some of you might remember back to biology class, you're like, hey, wait a minute, don't all mammals have fur? Aren't all mammals fur bears? Well, kind of, but in a management sense, fur bears are, are designated as critters that have historically been harvested for their fur. So some states will treat animals uh, differently depending on just a lot of different factors. Like Wisconsin, where I was, um, pretty much all the normal fur bears are fur bears, but then once you got into wolves, now it's a big game animal. It's no longer a fur bear because a little bit different management. Uh, cougars the same way, which a transient animal, but would get them with enough frequency that uh, that they're definitely classified. So a little bit different. This is a management classification. This is not a, a biological or anything like that. Uh, keep that in mind. Super diverse group, though. I mean, we're talking uh, all the way down to our only marsupial that gets into North America, our opossum. That's a trappable critter, one that's very common across most of Illinois. Anybody that drives knows that. Uh, all the way up to beaver, which is the second largest rodent in the entire world, largest rodent in North America. So really, and I mean, you're talking predators, you're talking prey, 
uh, water, land, all habitat types. Fur bears are really an interesting group, and, and we'll talk more about them as we go here. But since they are such a diverse group, the management of them is also diverse. And here, uh, some of you, if you ever took ecology or, or any kind of wildlife management class, you may recognize this. This is the, uh, this little um, fancy colorful chart over here kind of shows you in a nutshell all of the different wildlife populations that we hunt or trap. This is their basic population cycle where right now we're in February, we're actually at the basically the lowest of the low of almost all these species, right? Because pretty soon we're going to start to have young be born and that accounts for that graph going way high up there. And basically everything in that lesser shaded red is basically the seasonal surplus. All of these animals, uh, they are to some extent our strategists. So they produce more than can possibly live. And that, you know, survival of the fittest, right? We've all seen the, uh, the nature documentaries. We know how it goes. Uh, so you got all this plethora of these critters out when resources are at their peak. And then as resources dwindle through the fall, less and less can survive until we get to right now. Look at February, look around what's what's left out there to eat. It's hard going. There's only a certain amount of critters that can uh, that can make it through that. The goal of these hunting and trapping seasons across all species, not just fur bears, is to basically just take animals from that uh, seasonal surplus, or we call it the harvestable surplus when we're talking about uh, humans, and uh, leave the carrying capacity, that breeding stock, so that population stays pretty much pretty good. I mean, no population is going to be as flat as a tabletop, you know, who, who are we kidding, but... Uh, pretty, you don't want super big peaks and valleys. Now, I mentioned this before, there's some, some fur bears like raccoons and coyotes that there might be more on the landscape in Illinois today than at any point in our history. Um, and that's because if you look back to like pre-settlement times, you might think, oh, they're crawling with animals. Absolutely was crawling with animals, but guess what? It was also crawling with a lot of larger predators that made uh, critters like the raccoon and the coyote kind of have to be uh, knocked down into a lesser niche. Right now, these critters kind of run the countryside, but back then, guess what? They did not. There was bigger brothers around, and uh, it, it was a completely different time. So, Right now, management goals, raccoons, coyotes, uh, and especially other critters like beaver who have a tendency to be at odds with human engineering. They like to clog up culverts, flood roads. Uh, this makes people very, very angry, obviously. All these things make wildlife manage managers say if a critter has a legitimate use, and people who want to go for it, like we should utilize these hunting and trapping seasons to mitigate these uh, wildlife human issues that pop up. Does it eliminate all of them? Obviously not, but at least you have a public that's out there basically keeping them at bay. And by the way, supporting conservation and wildlife management while they're at it, all good stuff. Uh, another bonus that comes from this is the ability to monitor very difficult to monitor species um, and this is this is a gold mine for researchers when you're talking about biologists oh let's see they come up with some question they need mink fur where are you going to get mink fur how expensive is it going to be for a biologist to travel around illinois trapping mink all expensive i'll cut out the whole story and just say expensive guess what? They've already got trappers trapping mink. They can go to a fur auction, find mink from all over the state and say, hey, do you mind if I clip just a tiny little piece of a DNA sample from your hide uh, to support this work that I'm doing? And for the most part, trappers are supportive of that. So just imagine that uh, ability to have all that data that otherwise you would never have access to. Uh, not only that, but animals like bobcats which are really secretive hard to get a, a feel on what's going on um trappers 
do that. And if you're in a state like Illinois, you, you have to have a tag to uh, take a bobcat. That opens up a possibility for researchers to work with trappers if they're trapping coyotes and they do trap a bobcat. Researchers can come out there and slap a collar on it and learn a ton about the population. Uh, in Wisconsin, we had over 100 cats that we collared, uh, all trapped incidentally by trappers who were trying to trap coyotes, didn't have a tag. Uh, called them up, slapped a collar on them. Not a single capture-related mortality. So that kind of tells you how, how how good live restraining traps are of today. We'll talk more about that as we go. Let's talk a little bit about tracks. This is not a tracking webinar. We do have one specifically on that. So if you're interested in this, definitely check that out. But I do want to point out a couple that everybody always wants to know. First off, is it cat or dog? This is a big breakdown. Uh, if you count the toes and you have four toes, generally you're dealing with either a cat or a dog, unless if the substrate wasn't uh, suitable to get all five toes, that, that definitely happens. But for the most part, your critters that are gonna show four toes on a decent sized tracks are either gonna be cat or do dogs because they both have the dew claw that's up on the leg doesn't show up in tracks. Now, once you have that, how do you break down cat versus dog? Couple good ways. First one is the claw marks. Uh, now, obviously cats have claws, bobcats, house cats, mountain lions, they all have claws. They are retractable. So they don't walk around with a mouth. Those are their weapons. Uh, the one thing I'll mention is if it's muddy, they will put them out sometimes. So if you see a track and you're like, wow, this really looks like a cat track, but there's claw marks, uh, don't rule it out because it is possible. Obviously they, they do have claws, but also look at their toe alignment. Cats have, they're not completely symmetrical. It's asymmetrical. So they have what's called a leading toe. Uh, when you look at the dog, and this is any dog, this is fox, coyote, uh, somebody's pet dog, check out your pet's dog uh, tracks next time you're outside. Pretty symmetrical. Not only that, they're so symmetrical that generally, if you look down in the coyote track uh, in the bottom left, you can kind of see an X. Very symmetrical, X. Uh, in the bobcat tracks, you can't make an X out of that with the way the toes and the pad are. Just doesn't work. Um, another way is to look at the very rear end of the of the pad. Cats are going to have three lobes. Dogs have two. Um, on the front of the pad, dogs have one lobe. Cats have uh, two. So a lot of different ways to tell them apart. Now, once you know it's a cat or a dog, identifying whether it's a fox, coyote, or domestic is going to depend on size shape, all these things. I'll tell you that coyote fox traps uh, tracks are very egg shaped, like the picture that's down there. Anything that's splayed out at all, gonna be a dog. Uh, you can also look at the pattern. Foxes and coyotes run very direct straight lines, whereas dogs are all over the place. So you can use pattern to kind of tell you that. With cats, a little bit harder because cats are all random, I feel like, whether it's a bobcat, house cat, all the way up to mountain lion. I haven't ever got to see a mountain lion track, unfortunately, but I'm sure they act the same way that uh, they, they're they just a little bit unpredictable. Whereas dogs uh, always are running right down the trail generally, cats a lot of times seem to perpendicular. Remember, it's an ambush predator, so a lot of times they're moving slow. They don't need to be running fast down a trail, uh, so they do travel places that dogs don't go. Next little track, that could, just because you'll see these all over the place, a possum and raccoon, okay? Uh, very distinctive tracks. The uh, We have the possum tracks over here on the left. The front track it almost looks like a human track. Just imagine if a little bitty tiny human was, you know, just splatted his hand down there. That's basically what it would look like. That's a possum track. And then their rear track, they have that halix. So you can see that thumb. That's diagnostic. If you see that uh, halix coming out almost at a right angle, you know, you're dealing with a possum. Raccoons, on the other hand, 
look how everything is straightforward. Uh, you can't really see the um, our box is a little bit in front of the uh, front track, but a raccoon track kind of looks like a human hand too. But instead of being splayed out, everything's brought together. Long fingers, everything's uh, together, five. And then their rear foot, uh, kind of the same, same way, almost uh, uh, really long fingers. And uh, raccoons are actually plantigrade, so they walk on flat feet like bears and, and people do. Not many animals do that. Most walk on their toes. So pretty cool. You'll cut, run into these tracks everywhere. So good to know what they look like. And of course, if you count the toes, five on all these. Tracks are not the only sign that you can look for. Scat, uh, really common. Animals like raccoons, they like to show off their scat. It's, it's kind of a marker. They can tell other raccoons, hey, I'm already here. Look, I'm eating really well. Look at the size of that scat. Stay away from me. I'll beat you up. Uh, otter do the same thing. You can find otter toilets. They'll habitually go in the same way. This is a territorial marker for them. Same way with coyotes. Uh, I tell people, if you find an area that's got a real concentration of coyote scat, that's the place to track. Uh, to trap. Sorry, keep going back from tracks, traps. Uh, it's like a tongue twister. But anyway, a plethora of coyote or fox scat shows that you're on the edge of their home range. And the reason that's an excellent place to trap, they spend um, a extra amount of time in the periphery of their home range because that's where they have to guard from others coming in. That's also the area where there's the most overlap. So when you find those spots, dynamite, dynamite trapping spots, because generally you're hitting three or four different home ranges and uh, the animals are there more often than just a random spot within a single home range. So good stuff there. You can also, some animals, I mean, beaver are famous for making their own ecosystems. Cool, they're great, they're awesome. And I should always mention out, or I should always mention that the uh, trapper's goal is never to trap out an area. You know, they want to come in, trap the overflow, and leave some. So trappers love beaver ponds just like everybody else. The problem is when the young of the year beaver go to uh, a new place and start blocking somebody's culvert, now they're an issue. Those beaver need to be trapped. But muskrat will make push-ups in the fall. They'll start, uh, they, they almost seem to pop up overnight. I think it takes them a little longer than that to make them, but they do make them pretty quick in the fall. And by the time the uh, lake is iced over, little huts all over the place that they can swim hut to hut to hut, finding food and then get up out of the water and breathe, but uh, not be susceptible to predators. Another thing duck hunters always got to look out for and trappers, anybody with waders, beaver cuttings. They can be super sharp, uh, go right through your waders there. And everybody knows beaver dams. Now, what are legal game for trappers? Coyote, fox, which includes red and gray. Bobcat, which is by permit only. Raccoon, possum, weasel, beaver, mink, river otter, muskrat, badger, striped skunk, and woodchuck. Woodchuck has its own special season, so it's not generally uh, considered with the rest, because guess what? Woodchuck hibernate. They're not around for a lot of the winter and fall when most of these seasons are going on. Uh, but for this past trapping season, which is just about to come to a close, November 10th to February 15th, the primary, uh, well, that was two ago, but it ends February 15th this year, too, in 2024. So it's almost over for everything except for otter and beaver, which run through the end of March 2024. So still got a little bit of time on, on the, the larger water fur. Now, trapping, super diverse, don't have time to go through all of the regs in a quick webinar. We're going to hit just some of the highlights and talk about why these things exist. Site exposed bait law. If you have any bait that is exposed to the air, 
you your trap needs to be 30 feet away from that so it's okay to take a little bit of bait put it in a dirt hole you know cover it up so it's not visible from the air right at your trap that's fine but you cannot take a big hunk of meat or uh, anything from an animal and put it right at your set and the reason is that attracts birds of prey does that attract mammalian predators absolutely but it also attracts avian predators and we don't want that we don't want to catch any of those so don't use sight exposed bait it's easy because all these critters that we're trying to trap really use their nose more than they do anything else so uh don't worry about sight exposed bait it's fine like uh, when i was in wisconsin trap in some areas you could have a bait pile or something and trap around that but again you had to be a certain distance away from any sight exposed bait and uh, really the further away the better because most of these animals if you've got a coyote or a fox coming into bait it basically feels like you raiding somebody else's uh, kitchen right they're kind of nervous they're going to creep in they're they're waiting for somebody to come out and tackle them for trying to steal their food so uh, setting further away from bait piles is generally better all traps need to be tagged no question anything you set out absolutely has to be tagged you can either do your customer id or name and address depends on what you want i recommend customer id because then you don't have to get new ones every time you move there's a bunch of regulations on, on the size placement restrictions snares can only be in water as well as large body grips um, may not trap within 10 foot from dens on land so if you see a hole in your yard uh, you can't just trap right on that um, that doesn't not for the water only for the land may not trap within 100 yards of a house without the occupant permission that's obviously to protect pets um, and do not disturb dams lodges feed beds anything that animals create you can't go out there and just knock them down <clears throat> now there are uh, circumstances where you can get permits to remove beaver dams that are causing damage but uh, you got to go through the proper channels for that uh, no teeth, no deadfalls, no colony traps in Illinois, which is a common one in other states, no multiple catch of any type in Illinois, including colony traps for muskrats. And uh, yeah, trapping is one of the most regulated activities you can do. Uh, I don't say that to scare you away. It's just it's very diverse. But uh, we at the Illinois Learn to Hunt team, we're always here to be a resource for you. You get questions reach out and we will try to answer them as, as quickly as we can. Now, finding the statewide regs. This is just basically, this is not the regs in their entirety. This is the uh, Cliff Notes version, but this is definitely something that all trappers are gonna print out and carry with them at all times. It's hard to remember all this stuff, so refer to it often. Now, finding places, you can, uh, there's online tools how you can find places that are open to trapping and also different types of hunting. Uh, HuntIllinois.org, some of you have played with that. Don't forget that when deer season is open, just because you're trapping, not deer hunting, you still need to wear blaze orange or blaze pink. Uh, it's the law, but also you wanna be safe. You don't wanna have a bunch of deer hunters out there and you're out there wearing your brown car heart crawling around not a good idea where your hive is for sure easy to forget about if you're not deer hunting yourself so we put it in there <clears throat> now the trapping specific license for residents 10 bucks great deal great deal you do need the habitat stamp which of course you need for everything Trapper education is required for new trappers born after 98. Definitely recommend anybody who's getting into it, take the trapper education course. You can take it online, um, doesn't take you too long. Just get it done, even if you're grandfathered in, it'll probably go over some stuff that, uh, that you need refreshers on. This stuff changes all the time. 
Uh, we mentioned in here Bobcat Lottery. That's obviously long gone since the season's almost over for this year. But definitely uh, look for it for next year if that's something that interests you. Five bucks to get in that. And we don't have a uh, Fisher in Illinois. This, I must have been, had a brain fart from uh, Wisconsin where we did have Fisher. But Bobcat and Otter need to be registered in Illinois. Both of those species are CITES, which right here, we'll talk about that. Bobcat and River Otters are CITES species. That's the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species. Now, neither of these are endangered species, nor are they anywhere close to being endangered. In fact, the last uh, population assessment of both critters uh, across almost all of their range, they're either stable or increasing, so doing very, very well. Uh, bobcat actually to the detriment of lynx, but that's another story. But <clears throat> Bobcat and river otter are both on Appendix 2 of CITES, which is look-alike species. Every other species of otter in the world is endangered other than river otter. Every other species of spotted cat in the world is endangered other than bobcat. I think that says something when I say what I just said and then also uh, mention to you that when they did the population assessment, Bobcats, river otter going up almost nationwide. That shows you that this this management it works. And I know it's a bummer to have to draw a bobcat tag, but it's a species of lower reproductive potential. And basically, they just need to gather the data to justify increasing tag opportunities. And I think we'll slowly get there because our population's doing really well. We just ran a camera, Jason, and we had a. a, a we had three different pictures of bobcats. It could have all been the same one, or it could have been three different ones for all we know, but uh, bobcats doing really well. Um, I know we don't see them, detectability really low, so uh, you don't see them, but they are out there. Bobcat tags have to be drawn before you can attempt to take one. Now, if you're trapping coyotes and you incidentally trap one, you haven't broken the law, but you do need to uh, release that cat as quickly as possible unharmed. So all trappers have to be prepared to release an animal. I recommend a good quality catch pole. Um, also a really good solid tub that's large enough to put on an animal the size of a bobcat works really well. You just put that tub over them, put your knee on it, and then get their foot out, let them out flip the tub and then hope they don't come after you they usually don't that's a curtis that's a really awesome photo is that someone that you knew that took that photo oh yeah matt brinkman my buddy i started working with uh, the institute for wildlife studies with him trapping predators on the beach in southern california i know hard gig tough gig right uh but yeah he Wildlife photography, photography, a, a passion of his. He got these pictures, I think, in California while he was working on a pronghorn uh, project. But really excellent photos of a bobcat. That's really yeah, cool. Way to call that out. And Matt Brinkman, good job with the photos if you ever see this. Yeah. Now, we mentioned trapper education before, even if not required, recommend taking it. And if you go to a place like the Illinois Trappers Association yearly rendezvous, a lot of times they'll have an in-person class right there. It's great to take the in-person class because you're going to get to learn from somebody who does it. You can also probably meet some people who will help you with your network connection because uh, trappers want to have friends right they want to have connections because unlike hunting where you can take a day off trapping you cannot once your traps are set you're running those every day until they're pulled so if i'm trapping and i break my leg i don't get a get out of trapping free card i've got to find somebody to run my traps if i can't so i would have a partner and i would say hey jason i can't get to my traps can you come over and pick up my gps or i'll send you my points can you run them for me real quick? You have to have that backup plan, absolutely. And here we have the uh, the links for this. We'll send these out uh, in the uh, in the links in the description here as well. 
Now, I always say there's basically two types of traps if you want to break them into just two categories. We've got live restraining traps and killer type traps. We're going to start with live restraining traps. All of these traps here are designed to capture an animal and hold it safe and alive until you're able to get there and either dispatch it or release it. This includes footholds, uh, foothold traps, which includes long springs and coil springs, enclosed trigger traps, which are what we call the dog proof traps, and then also box or cage traps. And these vary uh, obviously for the varying size of critters we have out there. Now the other type is killer traps. This, the polar opposite. Now our goal is to catch an animal and to dispatch it or kill it as quickly as possible. And most of these traps work through thoracic compression. They're actually the exact same uh, way of dispatch as a mouse trap. So if you've ever used a mouse trap, this trap right here in the picture looks like probably a 220. Um, that basically is just a mouse trap for a little bit larger mouse. Um, and they go all the way up to a beaver sized mouse if you, you got a 330. So a lot of people will call these traps Kana bears. That's definitely not wrong, but that is a, a trademarked name. So technically they are body grip traps, not Kana bears. Curtis. Yes. Um, sorry to cut you off. Uh, when it comes to the similar to like gauges and things like that with ammunition, I've heard you throw out the, the numbers corresponding to the traps where, where those numbers come from and, and does bigger mean bigger trap does smaller mean smaller trap what, what's going on with that sometimes yeah so a lot of times the numbers are come up with by the manufacturer so like uh, for example when it comes to body grip trap the 110 cona bear 110 body grip trap uh, that's 110 square centimeters and then as they made bigger ones a 110 okay now uh, if I add another spring to it, let's call it a 120. Now a, a size up, let's call it a 160. Another size up, oh, let's call it a 220, 330. Uh, so those numbers don't exactly coincide to the number of centimeters that only the first does. And then when it comes to the footholds, uh, just they start like the smallest one used to be a number zero you know, one, two, three, so it would go up, but now you have uh, trap manufacturers that, you know, the MB 550 or the, you know, so the numbers now are a little bit harder to keep track of. And that's why the uh, trapping BMPs, which is a document that can help you find traps, we'll talk about it here in a second, uh, but it actually talks about traps and gives you not only the name, but the size. So even if you don't know what the heck it is, if you've got a tape measure and you can measure it, uh, you can pretty much tell where it fits within the BMPs. Uh, snares, also the cable device in Illinois, these are only allowed in the water. They have to be at least half underwater, as well as any of the larger body grip traps. So anything over seven inches on one side, if square. There are round ones out there. Then you got to bust out your old, uh, everybody remember how to um, come up with the area of a circle. Is that pi, pi r squared, pi d? Well, yeah, you see, look at that. Our math teachers were right. This could come in handy someday. Th this is that day. Now, trap preparation. If you're interested in this, we just did a whole webinar on only this. Definitely check that out. But this is a multi-step process. Don't think you're going to buy a trap from the store and set it the next day. Nope, not going to happen. You've got to dye that thing. You probably are going to have to wax that thing. You're going to have to file it. You may have to add modifications. There's a whole lot of steps before uh, it's game ready, as they say. Traps are not the only piece of equipment that you need. Unfortunately, trapping is equipment heavy, like duck hunting, uh, equipment heavy. Don't let that scare you away. You can start very small. There's no rule that says you're only a trapper if you run 100 sets, like, no. Uh, if you have two or three traps and you have your own property that you want to maybe manage predators on and learn a little bit about them while getting some awesome fur garments made, you're a trapper. Uh, so don't let that scare you, but you do need more things than just traps. Got some examples here. Um, 
if you're trapping for coyotes, that's what you're going for. You're going to have to have a sifter. You're probably going to have to have most of the tools shown there. Most people are going to use cable stakes as opposed to re-rod just because of the weight. Um, and, you know, the cable stakes seem to hold up really, really well. Uh, got quick links there. You may even have to weld those shut. Coyotes are strong, strong animals. Uh, but all this stuff serves a purpose. Bait versus lure. Bait is anything the animal can eat. Lure is something that they can't eat but is attractive to them. So the reason this is important is because bait is non discriminative, right? If I dig a hole and I put a chunk of muskrat in there, that could catch a raccoon, a coyote, a fox, a bobcat, an otter, a me anything that eats meat, right? Uh, which I might be happy with. But if I want to make my set more selective, maybe I'm only trapping foxes, coyotes. I could use a lure as opposed to a bait. It still may have some appeal to some of those other critters if I use some red fox urine and red fox gland lure, uh, but it's going to have a lot less appeal to those other critters and more appeal to the ones I'm after. So definitely think about that stuff when you're, when you're constructing your equipment. Now, I mentioned this before. I'm going to mention it again. BMPs of trapping, best management practices of trapping. This is actually one of the largest research projects uh, involving wildlife that has ever been conducted in North America. It's still ongoing to this day, and it started in 97. So do the math. Long time. They've completed BMPs now for almost every single fur bear that's in North America. I think they're still finishing up Wolverine, but everything else is done. And if you go to the AFWA, this is the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, go to their fur bear page. You can search it, AFWA Fur Bears on Google. It'll pop up. You can go through and look at all the best management practices for each species. If you're interested in beaver, click on beaver. You can read through. They're all available for free. They update them, I think, every single year or as soon as they have new data available. Uh, and they have just a mountain of data for this. And these documents can recommend what traps are going to be the best for each species. Really elaborate way they do these. They work with actual trappers all across the, the country and they send a technician with them the trapper will pick the spot and then the technician will randomly generate which trap they use at that location then every catch is recorded it's immediately dispatched bagged and frozen to go get a full necropsy by vets with radiographs and everything to score every injury so a really awesome ironclad uh, data set that not only helps trappers to pick the right equipment, but also has been a savior for trappers when folks like animal rights activists may try to attack trapping as being inhumane. Uh, well, excuse me, we've got uh, data since 1997, a mountain of it that was uh, is standards by the ISO, the International Standards Organization, the same people that regulate agriculture and a number of things we re rely on all the time. Um, we have that data set that shows that it, it is humane and we have awesome, awesome capture tools out there in both the live restraining and the killer type traps. Curtis. Uh, just wanted to, we got some questions in the Q and A and that was, you're kind oh, yeah. of referencing, you're referencing some, uh, resources there that people can look that up. Um, do you have other resources that you could recommend, uh, like a book or YouTube channels that you've used in the past? <clears throat> um, I have, uh, so the problem with YouTube stuff is it's very state specific. Every state is so different that, yeah, there's a lot of good state stuff. I could, I, Used to work in Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Trappers Association has some awesome, awesome trapping videos. Um, problem is it's Wisconsin specific. Some things mm -hmm. they do are not legal here. Like they can use cable restraints. We can't do that here. Uh, some things we can do, they can't do. So um, while they're great videos and I definitely recommend watching them, you can't necessarily take what you see and apply it right to here. 
but you can certainly watch them and, and it's a great way to see stuff because yeah trapping is one of those things you got to do it you know this webinar is meant to be an introduction to kind of get you excited about it but this takes a lot of hands-on stuff to, to really do it justice for sure yep. um, as far as books the national trappers association the nta handbook they do have a trapping handbook that's intended for uh, newer trappers and it uh it's really good definitely check that out I, it's less than 20 bucks i'm pretty sure last i checked and if you go to the national trappers association webpage, they'll have those for sale there really good book again that's a national book so it's not going to have exactly illinois specific stuff but really good uh starter basis for just trapper knowledge the last thing I'll say about that is just keep an eye on our channel. We're going to keep putting out more and more trapping content. And of course, our stuff will be Illinois related. We were really trying to get an in-person beaver trapping workshop in this year. And I guess there's still a slight chance, but we uh, ran into an issue finding a good spot. So, so far, no luck. Hopefully next year we we will. But watch for that definitely to be coming um but yeah on any of that stuff keep in mind each state very very different so make sure you know where it's coming from and then not to scare people off but i remember the one time we were in a sporting goods store and we went to the trapping section and you were pointing at stuff that was on a shelf saying that's not ideal that's not great and i maybe even illegal i'm not even sure if you said that but well, they, um, they might sell stuff listed as a coyote snare which is not legal in, yeah. in illinois yeah beaver snare sure the same device underwater could be legal but they had it specifically listed as a coyote snare so yeah so even the careful. stuff that might be on the shelf so now i will say if you go through a reputable trap dealer meaning not farm and fleet or bass pro or your local store um they probably are carrying stuff like i know bluff city outdoors in alton uh they're they're a lot more careful about what they put on their shelves and uh yeah any any reputable trapping shop should be better than your local store but yeah that's just a store manager ordering stuff without knowing the local laws, probably. I mean, who knows yeah. if, if it's, it's a big available box store. for him to order. You know, the yep. people that make the catalogs don't have to include the regs in mm -hmm. there. So, And then last one uh, on the questions that we have so far. Thank you, Lauren, for, for engaging with us. We always like answering questions live. Uh, is uh, I, You might go into this further in the PowerPoint, but dispatching of animals when you find them in your traps. you have any uh, tips on that? And if you talk about that later on, that's totally fine. We can hit it when we get there. Yeah, we can talk about that now. That, um, that depends on the person. My personal preference, 22, I carry a 22 pistol and pretty much everything uh, that I would catch in live restraining traps, like I'm shooting in the head. Some people don't like that because it could be messy. Um, it is a good, quick, humane death, so I do it. Um, so there are other options. Some people ha will rig up a what's called a kill pole and actually put a large body grip trap on the end of a pole and use that to snap on animals and uh, basically kill them through thoracic uh, uh, compression. Some people could even make a CO2 tank and, and uh, dispatch animals through asphyxiation. Uh, you just basically a big box co2 tank fill it full of co2 it displaces all the oxygen and uh, asphyxiation all of those are um can't remember the exact terminology but approved methods of of dispatch for mammals um in in illinois and i guess across north america so my preference is 22 to the head uh some people will use the the kill stick just so it doesn't make a big mess mm -hmm. but yeah uh, good good question any safety precautions or tips you have with using a 22 do you go do you do it from close range do you do it from far away like what what are you close trying to range yeah for sure close range uh the animal is in a trap you know the trap is what renders the animal to your possession not the gun in this instance the trap so if you have the ability to get close and make the most humane shot possible that's what you should do um so yeah safety keep in mind 22s do ricochet 
especially if you get some of the uh, like CBs or shorts, uh, which sometimes people will use for trapping because it's a it's a smaller bullet. You don't need it to pass all the way through. If you hit a raccoon at an angle, their skull is thick enough. Uh, I've even heard of you know, CBs ricocheting right off a raccoon skull. So keep in mind the ricochets for sure. Uh, and around water too. 22s mm -hmm. are notorious for ricocheting around water. So always be, uh, always be safe when it comes to that. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Thanks. So it's good to handle these questions while, you know, while they build up so we don't get to the end and have a whole bunch, but now, when it comes to methods, we're, we're just going to touch on this again, because we're just, again, intro level. We're given the way high from the airplane view of trapping um, land sets versus water sets. Really easy. Got to love names that mean something, right? Land sets, sets on land. Water sets, sets that touch flowing or impounded water. Pretty easy. The reason these two things are separated is because there's different things that you can set. For example, cage traps can only be set on land. You can't set them in the water under normal circumstances. Um, a lot of the bigger uh, body grip traps and snares have to be at least half underwater. They can't be set on land at all. All of these sets have to be run every day and any captured animals have to be released or removed. So no exception every day. Now let's get into some actual methodology, how people might trap. Let's say you're a landowner and you come up on this beaver dam. Now at first you might be happy until the water starts backing up and up and up and up and now it's covered your road and now you're no longer happy. Um, there's always a trail somewhere around the middle part of the dam. Great place to look. This, this graphic kind of shows that. Great place to start on a nuisance job, especially if, if your main uh, deal is you want to deal with the nuisance beaver who are building this dam and potentially causing a nuisance somewhere. That's always a dynamite spot to look. Now, snares that have to be at least half underwater, you can also put them fully underwater. And this, uh, this set here on the right was a popular one we would do in Wisconsin once the ice would get on. You could basically just take any type of tree that they're eating, uh, popples, aspen, anything like that that's uh, next to the water's edge, nice straight pole, Affix, affix your snares to it like this one here and then scrape that bark off so that green bark shows off, uh, shows through and under the ice to a beaver that looks like a you know ribeye steak perfectly cooked just uh, just a beacon of, of something yummy there for them and then they'll come and swim and get caught in those snares and on this you can actually catch they've got two so if you get lucky and he doesn't knock them down you may catch more than one on the same same one. Now, when it comes to using footholds for beaver, a popular set is the caster mound set. And this, especially in the spring. Uh, so this is not used a ton in the fall, but in the springtime, beaver very territorial. And the, the young bachelors are out moving big time. A lot of the young beaver, the one and a half, two and a half year olds get kicked out uh, of their of their natal range uh, during the spring and they're moving so a lot of new animals moving around they'll throw up mud and kind of make a little mud pie right up on the bank and then deposit their caster scent on that mud pie so trappers can make a mock one of these put a little bit of beaver caster which you can get from a reputable trap store uh, up there and then situate your foothold or even a body grip trap if you can get it at least half underwater in the water leading up to that. Uh, now if you're using a foothold a lot of people will use um, like this has a stake out in deeper water and they're going to be using a heavy trap might even be tied to some weights or something for something like beaver. Um, for smaller animals like muskrat, a lot of times the weight of the trap is enough alone uh, to bring them under, but for beaver, you're going to need more weight than just that. 
Now, <clears throat> beaver and muskrat both can be trapped no matter what the water uh, you're dealing with. But here's just some examples of some popular uh, sets for them. And I always say muskrat is probably the best animal if you were going to pick just one to start trapping because all the equipment is small, relatively inexpensive. Muskrats are easy to take care of. They're easy to skin, easy to flesh. Everything about them is a great starter critter. It's also like the perfect fur for making stuff for Illinois winter uh, because most of the fur, raccoon, coyote, it's, it's actually too warm. If you're ice fishing or riding your snowmobile, it might be okay, but anything else, you're probably going to be sweating buckets. Muskrat, a little bit thinner, much nicer. You can actually wear that uh, doing some stuff. So great thing. And yeah, here's some sets you can set, whether it's iced up or open. Again, muskrats are herbivores like beaver, but instead of eating green bark like uh, beaver do in small twigs, Muskrat are going to be eating tubers, vegetables, uh, greenery, anything like that. So you can use uh, carrots, potatoes, apples, all very popular baits. And especially when we get late in the year towards the end of trapping season, which we're at, uh, food is at a low. So when you put uh, food under the water that they can see, it's really going to have a lot of appeal to them. Now there's the muskrat there and you see that one is on a weight weighted brick and the one thing I want to point out with this picture is you can see the trail that runs right along that rock. Now you might not ever pay that a second attention but it, when you're trapping you're going to notice that because muskrats like mice in your home they're critters of habit and that is going to have a trail on it probably from who knows how many dozens, hundreds of years of muskrats swimming right over that spot. So you don't need any bait, anything at all in a spot like that. When you find a great trail, you can put up a blind set and uh, have really good odds on, on critters like muskrats. Now, some of your basic raccoon sets, I got a picture of the dog proof or the enclosed trigger trap there because that is an awesome set for raccoons. It's, I don't want to say 100% species specific, but it is pretty species specific. And most of the time when you walk up, what you have is a raccoon. Almost impossible to catch dogs in them. Dog can't get its paw in there. So great traps for raccoon, but most of your basic raccoon sets are going to be what they call pocket sets right on the edge of the water. So basically you can set your trap under the water on the creek's edge or whatever body of water you're on and then dig a little pocket up in the bank just above that and put your bait and or lure uh, right there in that hole. So great great set for raccoons and mink and even otter and you will also see uh, sometimes people will set body grip traps uh, that could even be in a cubby and on a leaning pole because raccoons can actually climb which is another thing that's going to set them apart from dogs trapping them like that uh, can be a good way to get raccoons but make sure that you uh, are not going to incidentally catch a dog hey curtis yep just as a rundown, I think this could be a general question, but uh, Lauren, another great question, said that uh, she knows muskrats can be eaten and uh, just was wondering about how do they taste. And she did say that the beaver sticks from Hunt Camp were great. So thanks, yes. for, Lauren, for that. So I would say I this is the question of all the different fur bearing animals that people may not have tried eating before. You want to rank them really quick on on flavor? Oh, yeah, for sure. Now, this is going to depend on the person, of course, you know. But in my humble opinion, beaver is by far and away the, the king of the fur bears. I mean, it's it really is right up there with deer. Once you kind of know what you're doing, don't contaminate the meat with castor. You're in good shape. Um, muskrats are good, too. You know, I've heard down south there's even restaurants where you can get them and, and they call them, uh, what do they call them, like marsh rabbit or swamp rabbit or something, because obviously the name muskrat is not appealing. 
Um, to me, they're a little bit stronger than beaver. You know, beaver is more like a, really a beef substitute and muskrats kind of like, I don't know, you know, like almost like eating a, uh, a bouillon cube, you know, it's like they're rich. They're a dark, rich meat. So it's a little bit uh, too rich, I think, where I greatly prefer beaver. I use most of my muskrats for bait because everything likes to eat them. The beaver I save for me, muskrats get turned into bait. Uh, I will also say bobcat, really good, completely different than most other critters out there. It's a lot like pork. It's kind of a pinkish meat like that, and it really does kind of taste like pork, which is weird, but uh yeah bobcat worth a shot for sure um what else those are really the the best i think of the fur bears to eat is probably going to be in in that order beaver then muskrat and bobcat and then raccoon just behind that and there's nothing wrong with a raccoon it's a very generalized tasting meat it, the only thing that knocks raccoon back is so many people have an aversion to it because they've seen them in trash and all, all that kind of stuff, sure. which I understand. And they have the reputation of being a dirty animal and, and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? Put them in a crock pot with barbecue sauce and cook them long enough, and I bet your friends are not going to turn down a sandwich if you feed it to them. I'll tell you that. <laughs> But yeah, those are the ones. The only one that I would recommend not eat are going to be the aquatic predators. River otter especially have such a well-designed uh, kidney and filtration system. They can deal with a lot of heavy metals, PCBs, bad things that bioaccumulate. Not a good idea to eat them because then that stuff can bioaccumulate in us. So all animals are edible, but I would not recommend otter. And then so obviously mink would be in that uh, area as well. And then also if you ever are eating any predators, uh, especially from private ground, make sure that it's not uh, somebody's not trying to poison mice around there because that's another thing that can bioaccumulate. So something to keep in mind. So yeah, here's kind of a breakdown of that pocket set. So before we saw that raccoon was probably caught in a pocket set, here's what it would look like from the side. Uh, so you got the trap set right under the water surface. You don't need to cover it for raccoon, uh, mink, otter, any of that stuff. You would just kind of push it down into the mud as good as you can and uh, leave it. And especially being under the water there, they won't see it. And then your bait or lure is right above the water. Good for mink as well. Now for your canids, your coyotes and fox, and these are bobcat sets as well. Dirt hole is probably the king, and it's just it's basically intended to simulate a, a fox cache site. So this could be a little small hole about the size of a oh you got a bobcat walking right behind you, Jason. I just saw it, uh, but it had a long tail, so no, it's a house cat. Um, but so you're digging a small hole and putting your bait and or lure back in that hole, uh, usually some kind of backing just so you can kind of guide the animal which way you want to go. And then for coyotes, foxes, your trap actually does have to be buried. That's why you have to have the sifter, because uh, when you're done, it should look like you were never there. Um, so a little bit different and cool that... Uh, yeah, you're trapping, whether you're trapping raccoons in the water or coyotes in the land, but just look at how variable it is. Pretty awesome. And again, here's kind of what these sets look like uh, from the side if we were to break them down. Now, you don't always have to use dirt holes. This here is just uh, you can use kind of a scent post set or you can use a blind set and use nothing or people could call it a flat set if you don't specifically have a scent post uh, but basically your trap is always going to be buried under sifted dirt so it still functions most of the time you're going to have to put a pan cover over that trap or something underneath the pan because you don't want the dirt to fall underneath the pan because then it does not work uh, sift the dirt over the top, really good steak. Coyotes are very strong animals. If you stake a trap and you can pull up the steak, it's not 
staked enough. You know, you, you have to stake that where it's uh, more than you think. Um, so a lot of times people will double stake. You can get double stake swivels to go on the end of your chain. And whether you're using rebar or cable stakes, put two in, in an X pattern, and uh, that gives you the best holding power for sure. Now here's a dirt hole that's kind of made. You can call it a walkthrough or a cutout set, depending on what you do with it. This has stuff on both sides, so I would call it a walkthrough. But this kind of shows you how the dirt hole, you kind of dig it at an angle and I would even dig it at a steeper angle than this, more like 45, so that I make sure when I get that bait in there, it's not visible from the air. And then as an added defense, make sure you put something over the top. Just grab a handful of grass. Coyotes and foxes are going to be able to smell it, no problem, no issue there, but cover it up in the hole. Now, trapping is only half of the of the uh, kind of battle, so to speak, when it comes to trapping. The other half is fur handling. Once you get the critter in hand, you are far from done. Um, you got to skin that critter right away, especially if it's something like beaver, muskrat, bobcat, raccoon that you might want to eat or somebody else might want to eat. Got to get it done right away get the meat taken care of, but then you also have all the fur. Now, most trappers will choose to skin one day, roll up all your hides, uh, roll them up so it's fur side out, and stuff them in bread bags or something like that and put them in the freezer so that you can flesh them all at once. Build up a nice, uh, nice pile, and then this wooden thing here in the center, that's called the fleshing beam. And that uh, two-handled knife is a flushing knife. You put the hides, they're already skinned out, but obviously still got some fat and flesh hanging on. You drape it over that fleshing beam and use the two-handed knife to scrape it all off. And this is something that obviously gets easier the more you do it. It starts off pretty tough. It's a great workout. Uh, but one of the reasons why muskrats are so good is you don't need any special equipment. You can really do muskrats with just a spoon, just a regular old kitchen spoon. Uh, scrape all the fat off with that and then eat your cereal with it. No problem. Now, utilization. You know, a lot of people think about trapping and uh, they're like, yeah, well, I, I'm kind of a bigger fan of hunting because at least they use everything. And I usually argue that uh, for the most part, good trappers are going to utilize even more than hunters do because um, they're a lot of times taking all the meat they can. They're also taking the fur. They're taking the glands to use to make lures and, and uh, even to trade for other trapping equipment. I mean, when it comes to beaver, I know people that sell the feet uh, to other people who make um, keychains out of them. Uh, the tail, beaver tail, is sold for the leather or fly fishermen buy them. I mean, yeah, just all these different parts, uh, trappers find a way to get a use out of it. And it's a great time to get fur garments made for yourself. Right now, the fur market in general is low. You know, you're, you're not going to go out and trap and make a ton of mov money. You know, it's just not going to happen. Beaver prices are a little bit strong, so you can actually do pretty decent trapping beaver right now uh, if they hold mostly because of Yellowstone and everybody wants a really nice cowboy hat, which is made out of beaver felt. Um, but everything else is, is pretty low. So uh, excellent time to save up the fur, get something made for yourself. If you can flesh it, you send it to a tannery. We will have a link for uh, uh, Sleepy Creek Tannery is in Iowa, not that far away. They have decent prices. They have pretty good turnaround time. Generally, you get your stuff back within about six to eight months, which uh, may sound like a long time, but for this, it really is not that bad. Once they send you back the uh, tanned garment, if you're decent at sewing, you can make something yourself. If you're not decent at sewing like me, you can find somebody to do that, and there are furriers out there that'll take your tanned furs and make something like a coat, a vest, mittens, a hat, out of your own fur. And I mean, you wanna talk about the coolest 
uh, outdoor clothing you can have. I mean, people think Sitka and uh, First Light is cool. Well, just imagine a hat made out of a coyote that you trapped on your favorite you know, property or your family farm or whatever it might be. Uh, and a well-made fur garment can last for three generations. So this could be something you actually pass down and someday your kid or grandkid could be wearing it being like, oh yeah, my grandpa trapped this coyote back in, you know, the crazy summer of 24 or whatever. <laughs> it wouldn't be summer if you're trapped in the winter of 24. There you go. Um, but anyway, a lot of utilization, a lot of cool stuff you can do, and uh, it's really not that expensive. A lot of the uh, one in Wisconsin wild things for if you send them your own hides, the going rate for a mountain man hat was about 60 to 70 bucks. So not bad for a piece of clothing that could last three generations and be warmer than anything you can buy at uh, Bass Pro. Now, additional resources will include a lot of these when you get the recording. We'll have the uh, these in the notes, but you can also search these. I mentioned Sleepy Creek Tannery. IDNR's got a lot of trapping info. You can find uh, good stuff there. Grunwald Fur and Wool, I didn't mention them yet, but they actually do routes all around Illinois. They'll come and pick up your fur. They buy your fur right then, give you a check uh, so you don't have to wait. Fur Harvesters Auctions is actually an auction house. Them, you send your fur to them and they go sell it at an auction and you get money after it sells. So there's a bit of a wait there, but uh, it's <clears throat> a gamble. You got to decide, are you going to make more money now or then kind of thing. And then we always got to mention our uh, partners and good friends of ours, Fur Takers of America and the Illinois Trappers Association. They both have pages, check them out. And if you're interested in trapping, consider joining them. They both have magazines. They both give you different magazines. So if you join both, you're not gonna be doubling up. You're gonna get all the best trapping pub publications there are to, uh, out there because ITA gives you Trapper's Post and Fur Takers of America has their own magazine. And between the two, uh, th that's it. That's the golden tuna for trapping magazines. That's that's the big two. And, and those folks, cool... oh, sorry to cut you off, buddy, but I just want to say that those folks are extremely welcoming and uh, and uh, and just generous with information and time. Uh, I, more so than I, most other organizations that we promote. I mean, all organizations are awesome, and people are out there, and they all they all have a a care for what they're doing, and and you can see it in in how they talk about it, but. The trapping folks are, I think, uh, head and shoulders above the rest when it comes to when you actually sit them down and start talking to them and, and asking them questions. They seem to be the more the most giving with their time and information. So if you do have any questions, do not be afraid to reach out to those organizations. Uh, just the brief inter, uh, interactions that we've had with them when we partnered with different organizations and also going to the Trapper Rendezvous and everything else. Uh, everyone is just genuinely just really, really nice. And if you're new to this, uh, activity. It's a really interesting American subculture that uh, is very deep with knowledge. It's really, really cool. So that's my my outsider perspective of getting into the trapper. Them and also uh, the raccoon hunters as well. The coon dog guys are also really, really cool folks. But I digress. Go ahead, Curtis. No, oh, that's good stuff. And yeah, Jason even came to the uh, FTA rendezvous. The FTA does a yearly rendezvous each year, which is like a basically a throwback to a, a state fair or something from 150 years ago and really cool unique place and uh, Jason and a buddy of his came up and even though you know they're not trappers per se they had a good time and they found cool stuff there your buddy wound up I think buying some uh, some beaver mittens that he yeah. was just enamored with and all kinds of stuff Yep, I got my beaver koozie, which was affordable. He he was a big spinner and got the big mittens there. So he he has mittens that are they'll make his hands sweat in in at negative thirty degree temperatures now. But uh, no, it was really awesome and uh, again, really really cool interactions with folks and um, meeting new people. And uh, yeah, so it was just really really interesting. Uh, any raccoon hunting workshops coming up? Says Lauren. Mm, yeah, I hopefully we're, we're ever trying we, we've been trying to get some 
raccoon hunting uh, connections up around Chicago because yeah. obviously we have a ton of people up there. Right now, the problem is our connections are in Montgomery County, Illinois, which they're great connections. We held one workshop down there, and unfortunately, it was just so far away from most of our people. We did not have a good turnout. Um, so uh, we do not have any planned right now, but we are always looking. And if you hear of any raccoon hunting groups out there that may be open to working with us, please, please connect us, pass our name along because we that was one of our most fun workshops like like for a different thing that we only did once and done because we haven't yeah. found another good spot to do it so we're on the prowl and if you're interested in any of our workshops send us an email being like hey i'm interested and i have x and x friends and we're interested and tell us what part of the state you're in and that will help us with our scheduling um if we get enough requests for a certain area on a certain topic we'd be happy to to shoot over there and have a workshop and, and definitely keep you informed on when that's going to be. For sure. Yeah. We've talked about adding that to our webpage. We should do that, you know, where people can just request a workshop kind of thing. Good way to track. Maybe we'll look into that, but yep. here's Lauren, a, a says there, cool... so, Lauren said there's two guaranteed participants with her. So there you go. Okay. Anywhere in the state. Well, that's okay. We're two down. I think that's about what we had for the uh, the last one, right? It was two. It was two. I think people who showed up, and then the rest were staff and a D or DNR members, and we all yeah. went out and we all had fun. So that was fine, and we were all learning new stuff too. So we didn't. And those guys would have been doing it anyway. So that was also nice that we didn't waste their time because yeah. that's just what they do. Those fellows just go out and chase raccoons. And just to give people an idea of what that's like, uh, so it's it's still fur bear in a way. Um, so. Uh, they have their coon dogs. It's a it's more of a dog culture than culture than anything. And they take care of their dogs. They love their dogs, and uh, they, they they take them out almost every night. Uh, there's a there's a kill season where they can actually harvest raccoons, but these folks rarely harvest raccoons at this point because again the fur market's so low, and uh, they're just out there for their dogs. And they can also do this throughout the whole summer. So if you ever want to get into this activity, um, it's a year round activity that you can go do. You just aren't allowed to take the raccoons when it's not winter time usually because the, the fur is not as good. But uh, they have dog shows, they have dog trials. Uh, it's a huge game with their dogs, and they have collars on them with great uh, technology now, so they can see the GPS where the dogs are running to they know when the dog is treed a raccoon because of the angle of the collar so it can tell them when it's treed uh they know by the bark of the dog if it's on a scent they know by the bark of the dog if it's treed or not so they don't even really need the collars they could go old school without the collars but uh there's point systems on whoever's dog trees at first and second and third or doesn't treat at all and it's a whole game i mean it's this really cool field trial that's going on in the middle of the night that no one knows about um, and, and it, they're out there pretty much every night. So, uh, this is really cool. So sub, again, subcultures of America and I love it. It's awesome. And if we did a workshop where we basically just did a training workshop, not to take any raccoons, we could even do it in the spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, yeah, who knows? We're always open to a raccoon workshop. Stay tuned. Uh, we will try to get one as soon as possible. Here's what we do have. No raccoon stuff. We do have a couple fun things. I think the deer butchering one is now full. So sorry about that. But uh, if somebody drops out, then there will be a spot open. But we do have openings yet for February 17th, waterfowl ID in the classroom and in the field. This is going to be a fun day at, at Chautauqua and potentially Imaquan. Uh, we'll start at Chautauqua. But then we're going to go out in the field and we're going to go wherever the, the birds are good. So if they've got a million snow geese sitting over at Imaquan, we'll probably go over there. But uh, that should be a good time to see a huge number of snow geese and a ton of other birds too. And we're going to really dive deep into ID on that and it should be a good time. Our spring turkey workshops are getting filled out right now. So we got a couple scheduled here today. We're going to get a couple more tomorrow, hopefully. And this schedule definitely going to be posted here in the next uh, just coming few days. So stay yeah. tuned for that. Probably next week uh, sometime. And uh, I believe it has us doing something almost every week from here till mid-March. So uh, definitely have activities going on. So check that out for sure. Who gets sick of us. 
yeah plenty to learn and all different stuff so yeah that's gonna be a lot of turkey stuff coming up for the spring but uh okay so if anyone else has any more questions uh feel free to ask them now um and thank you curtis for for sharing all your knowledge there that's awesome thank you oh yeah trapping it it's a great thing to get into because like i mentioned before access to animals unlike with a lot of these other critters access is actually pretty high a lot of places you can go also public uh, or excuse me private land is actually fairly easy to get permission whereas we say deer is is really really tough not to say don't ask but super super tough when it comes mm -hmm. to something like beaver trapping coyote trapping uh, they almost come to you so it's almost the the polar opposite of something like deer but it can get you in and get you permission for stuff like deer and turkey so um great access and uh, you know critters like muskrat raccoon possum relatively easy to get into too so a good way to find a new basically activity to keep you outdoors longer all your hunting yep. seasons closed down. Guess what? If you're trapping for beaver, you can go all the way to the end of March. Take you right into turkey season. You know, what mm -hmm. off season, right? Yeah, that's for sure. There would be. Yeah. And then you can get, pick up raccoon dogs and then you can go go chase raccoons all summer long. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it's also an in. I mean, if it's a farmer and they have nuisance animals they want you to get rid of for them, you can help them out with that. And then that's that shows them that you're a responsible person and maybe they'll trust you to go on their land and, and have access to other animals to hunt there, too. So definitely another foot in the door. For sure. Yep. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, we can say good night. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, Curtis. We'll see you later, bud. See you.